All right. Uh, welcome to the KCP community meeting, August 24th, 2021. Um, Clayton added items, but I actually want to preempt that because uh, last week I promised a doc on how we're all thinking about moving moving apps transparently to become multi-cluster. A lot of this is, uh, well, the first part of this at least, is kind of a uh, review for folks who are coming to this new. I think the the prototype we've talked about for a while works somewhat like this, but I wanted to make sure that we update it to match what we're actually thinking. This is very similar to the prototype. Uh, instead of the deployment splitter, we have this general purpose scheduler, uh, which is just the deployment splitter that does more. Uh, some talk about what the API server does. The cluster controller is roughly the same as we've been talking about this whole time. Uh, I think we'll probably have it also be responsible for uh, validating and reconciling. No, you don't want it to. I'm see, I'm seeing vigorous head shakes from Clayton. No, uh, I. Well, okay, maybe I misinterpret. Um, sure. I actually, I don't know that the cluster controller as it is today will map, but we won't know until we come back in. Um, I really do expect a decoupled mapping though between location and cluster, which could have multiple implementations. So a controller makes sure. sense. Um, I don't want to see coupling of the controller for the logical cluster. The, yeah, so so the this cluster controller is roughly like, uh, this is for physical locations, phys or what we had been calling physical clusters. And throughout the stack, I call a physical cluster, even though it should be a physical location. This is the register some footprint of uh, register some footprint of compute to a logical cluster pool, uh, which does the registration logic, which I think we also need to go into, and then um, uh, basically to be able to to map. Uh, work to it down, uh, map work down to it from a logical cluster. It doesn't need to be in the same controller. There's nothing it does that needs to care about logical cluster policy, creation, validation, reconciliation. It could be a separate box relatively easily, right? It could just be some other third box that runs up here against KCP that says some new logical cluster has been created or the policy for some logical cluster has been updated or deleted. And uh, what do I need to do in response to that? So, so yeah. you're totally right. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to live inside this box. And if there's no reason for it to live inside the box, it shouldn't live inside the box. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think about it from the perspective of the OCM case. The OCM example was very useful from the perspective of Kubelet's registration process was honestly poorly designed, and we went through like five different iterations. And I don't think we still have a clear theory of that. I'm perfectly comfortable with how Kubelet registration and capacity reservation is maximally useful and minimally uh, overlapping with other things. OCM definitely went uh, further in one direction that I'm comfortable with in the sense of in the long run, uh, the act of registering capacity is actually, physical clusters are just one type of capacity. And so there's a whole set of things, which is location might be a good first stab at something that the scheduler cares about. I'm not quite convinced that physical clusters are the only mapping. Um, for instance, we may very well um, want to map um, the active placement of uh, shards of an or the, the act of bin packing instances of things that are not represented in transparent multi-cluster, in which case the scheduler might actually not be a component wholly owned by transparent multi-cluster. Um, so let maybe me we change the definition. Let, let, let's, yeah, let's, yeah. let's, transparent multi-cluster is a really broad definition right now. There is an orthog, like, just like in a service in Cube is not tied to the pub pod subsystem. Um, it's probably likely that some aspects of placement should be meaningfully decoupled from physical clusters, uh, and the mechanism of cube workload transparent. But that's probably may still be within transparent multi-cluster, but we probably want to come up with two different phrases for like the very concrete interloop, which today I would say I was thinking of transparent multi-cluster as the minimum necessary to run existing cube workloads. Mm -hmm. There's maybe the broader one, which is um, the subsystems that 
are reusable for other concepts. So scheduler is one. Cluster controller is actually too specific, probably, because of its tie to physical clusters, um, because there could very well be additional things. But it doesn't mean that this is necessarily wrong. It's we got to get really crisp on definitions here, because right. it would be very easy to accidentally couple physical clusters, cluster controller, scheduler, and the sinker a little aggressively um, or overly aggressively and miss an opportunity which OCM passed on for good reasons and which Cube didn't really have the domain expertise at the time to um, identify the, the ideal use case. Um, so we're left with like a, a mishmash of systems in the Kubelet and the node controller that yeah, really consistent, they solve the problem, but they're not orthogonal enough. Can you can you help me understand a situation where this where the scheduler it sounded like you were saying at least the scheduler and possibly the sinker would be implicated in a in in some sort of transparent multi-cluster where the resources aren't cluster resources. So it sounded yeah. like something like Yeah, I want to build a VM okay. controller that lets me represent VMs generically across four different cloud types. And I want the lowest common denominator subset, and I want uh, a VM image type that is opaque to the actual implementation. And that has to schedule um, VMs, higher level VM constructs, which have no analog on existing cube clusters, or maybe like similar to what kubevert does. Uh, in which case, location is not a physical cluster. Location might actually just be an AWS region. The active okay. controller, there is an argument potentially that you could either represent regions or zones opaquely and up level the ACK operator, the Amazon controllers for Kubernetes to tie the creation of specific instances into locations without actually being tied to the implementation. One way to do that is to have a controller that has permissions on the specific region and only that controller has those permissions, in which case the placement decision might be generic. So you might say like, hey, I need a VM. I don't care which it is, but you don't have a controller that has access to every AWS account, but you might offer two physical AWS accounts. And actually the concept of, uh, I put an EC2 instance into a location, which is AWS account one. And then I also want to spread that to a IAM rule and a load balancer, a set of resources, place that under location one, just by virtue of uh, some relatively loosely defined relationship, that scheduling relationship is really orthogonal to physical clusters. So that that's one example. I don't want to belabor it, but I want to put like yeah. an example be like scheduler, cluster controller, and sinker in all those cases. Sinker would be replaced by um, something that looks a lot like the ACK operator today. The scheduler okay. might actually be generic and the cluster controller would actually go away completely because the ACK operator, for instance, could um, be configured as like, I want to run an instance of the ACK operator that represents this this location. I have an account credential that allows me to act in that location. I'm running on protected infrastructure on a VM that's set up outside the system that can't be physically compromised by taking over the control plane, but I can offer the ability to run in a bunch of accounts. So you get like a nice separation of security domains which is something that people don't have today without building complex systems for themselves. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in that case, the thing that we would need to change about this is the, or the thing that we would need to decouple further is that the scheduler, uh, the cluster controller is responsible for more than just clusters because it's like location controller. But I don't right? know that it is though. Like, because the location controller, as you've described it, is about cube physical locations. And so maybe we should call it cube location controller. There might be an alternative controller that is tied to a location that implements that. Like a cubelet is a controller yeah. that implements yeah. that. That is all it is. A cubelet is a controller. So uh, you could draw an analogy between a, a an individual instance of a cubelet is itself an instance of a controller that would be closer to what the ACK model is. Yeah. A model where you then have a higher level, which is divvying out other, like a sinker is technically the location controller for a physical cluster location, because it is a controller running in a spot that offers yeah. resources that's tied to those resources as well. Um, and the sinker does not have to run on the physical cluster. So that's a, that's another thing that we have to be like, 
it's not an explicit thing. It's useful, but we should be like, this is maybe like the way most people will run it because it yeah, aligns yeah. the security domains. But it's also very important to note, um, you may want to run it adjacent or similar, in which case it doesn't have to in any way be, it can't be compromised by a compromise of the physical cluster um, because it has right permissions on the KCP IPS server. So I think like, yeah, we almost are kind of devolving into three diagrams. So there's this diagram, very pragmatic. We need to show a diagram that says, but wait, don't invest too much in these axioms, like as a 5%, 10% metal. And then there's a separate one, which is the security isolation diagram, which probably should show what a recommended, what are recommended alternatives for configuration. Don't have to do those now, just we can leave the note like, thinking about where the sinker runs and what it has permissions on is an important characteristic of a control plane uh, story, which is today that's all bundled together in one cluster. And so any compromise tends to escape unpredictably is putting the sinker on the physical cluster the most appropriate way to do it. We don't know yet. A, okay, what I'm hearing is a section on uh, different ways to run the sinkers and the advantages and disadvantages of each. Neither, no way is perfect, but right. they each provide some trade-offs. Uh, sinker in the cluster is better when you think the cluster might be uh, uh, independent failure domain. Sporadically, sporadically, sporadically un unreachable, the sinker can still which, do it. Which is a f fundamental tenet, and I think we have that yeah. in our core thing, is like a fundamental tenet is we are leveraging the cluster to perform an act of distributed resiliency. Placing the sinker someplace else might compromise that. So, But then right. the security trade-off is the sinker has access to the physical cluster. Um, if the sinker doesn't need elevated privileges. So like that, yeah, that trade-off section. Uh, uh, right. The, the sinker running inside of a physical cluster means that it is running instructions that can be confused to do other things. If it's running outside the, by stuff that's running inside the physical cluster, if it's running outside, it still has the same permissions to do the same things against that cluster, but it's harder to reach it to compromise it because it's running elsewhere. Maybe this is just a fancy way of saying is we didn't actually design Kubernetes with a threat model for out of cluster problems because at the beginning, Kubernetes did not have a unified application model concept. It also yeah. lacked um, the, we, we always treated a cube unit as a unit of independent resilience. And there were some assumptions that went in about separated versus non-separated control plane, for instance, that come with a bunch of trade-offs. Probably something we can do better here is clearly articulate the, the trade-off between those and show both options. Yeah. I also want to go back to, uh, so already the scheduler is going to be a lot. It's going to do a lot. It's going to have to know a lot. It's going to have to work very closely with the cube location controller and potentially other location uh, what, what we're we're closely with the controller. We're closely with the location type or location resources to know where it can put things, right? The arrow there is a little confusing. Uh, it's not actually to actually introduce the physical API object and clarify that. Because if you drew the cube model and you showed the cubelet talking to the scheduler, that would be horrifically incorrect. Right, right, right. You could say the scheduler sets a field in a one-way transition. And I think we could say, you know, we're looking for similar levels of clarity here. Yeah. In fact, it is clearer to just remove that entirely. The coop, the, the location controller updates and, and reconciles the location objects and the scheduler reads those and uses them to make scheduling decisions. Uh, the scheduler is already uh, going to be complex. I wonder if it would be a useful scoping of uh, a useful change of scope to say this is the like Kubernetes scheduler only for Kubernetes objects, not for VMs. And like until in the future we decide we want to extend to VMs, until in the future we want to extend to arbitrary arbitrary types. I feel like like uh, I would like to know more about that use case and the user who wants it before we start building that and building that amount of generality into it. And I think that's a great example. What I would probably say is don't write scheduler. In fact, like going back to that previous comment, it's actually much more useful to describe the API and API fields that comprise the input. And so a location for a scheduler to make capacity decisions, there has to be a place to read capacity. I would expect that as a more of a flow diagram. Maybe like a better way to do this is this it looks like a placement or a 
like logical topology diagram may be showing the flow of information from um, an object comes in, that's a request on a resource type and a set of extracted information from that resource type, some of which is relationships, some of which is constraints, and some of which is resources. And then the scheduler is solving for those that implies that lo either location or something associated with location carries resource and um, resource and constraints, um, or let's call it topology info, which we at least in the basic example, you know, described as labels on the um, described on location. The resource info is not included is capacity and usage calculated in the scheduler like it is in cube or is it implicit from a different mechanism we need to describe that that then makes it clearer because input for vms and locations could very easily like you're talking about how do you extract those features from an object which gets into the open discussions around is location a single type or duct type and we don't know yet um, and, and actually, like the location controller, we might just call it like a translation of units of physical capacity, like in the process diagram is somebody has to identify the physical capacity. That's both an automatic process and an administrative process. And then someone also has to identify the constraints. All three of those flow in and show up as the output of the location object, regardless of whether it's a controller or an aggregated API or five levels of that. Yeah. So, so the location would say, uh, an admin has set me up to say, you can use no more than 500 CPUs of me, let's say. And 300 of them are currently being used, so I have 200 left. That's also an important signal for it to emit. And I have the constraints, uh, AWS, US East 1, high security zone, whatever. Uh, that that bit of information, those bits of information live in the location object. Or, uh, well, at a minimum, those objects, those bits of information have to exist. The actual modeling of that, we would describe location as the first order approximation of it. And then we would probably come back and say, and is that the actual correct modeling? So we're, we're kind of like doing two things. We're trying to get to a prototype that shows the basic concept. And then we're going to throw away whatever pieces of that don't actually fit to the broader use case. So it's showing the three bits of info being modeled whether like right now there's a dotted line around all three of them that says location which implies a location controller of some form um, but that could very well be the sinker we don't have to assign that responsibility to the location controller yet the the sinker can't do the at least as far as i have been envisioning it the the cluster controllers responsible for register or registering right now it's a very dumb registration but in the future registration of a physical cluster, some portion of a physical cluster. And then it installs the sinker, right? So something, something whether the sinker is the person uh, uh, emitting this information back up, something needs to run first to install the sinker there or start. Yeah, the I, I feel like that's probably a, a, I would say right now, just based on what we know, I feel like that's going a little bit too far if, the sinker has permissions. So the sinker has a larger set of permissions than any individual logical cluster scheduled onto it. Ideally, and we've talked about this elsewhere, um, which we should record, make sure it's recorded, is we assume that the set of capabilities it has is not dramatically larger than the sinker. The act of granting permission to a sinker is itself a much larger permission. I would prefer that the cluster controller be heavily decoupled from the system for that reason, which is the cluster controller could be implemented by a GitOps flow, could be implemented by an operator, it could be implemented by an OCM style system, but it is absolutely not something that the, by default, I would expect the right architecture for this to have access to, but it does not mean that you cannot really quickly from a KCP be able to spin up a cluster controller that bundles all that, but we should make it clear that the cluster controller's responsibility is decoupled into these pieces that we expect it, right? Because just for practical reasons, I don't expect KCP servers to have root on the clusters they're operating, except in a dev yeah. and demo setup. Like we want to preserve that property and the cluster controller providing that property in a demo or test environment. We don't want people to accidentally confuse that with this is actually the mechanism that we want to use. Right. So then in that case, that makes sense. Uh, in that case, should 
the sinker subsume all the responsibilities of the of the cluster controller. And the way that you register a cluster is to install the sinker on it. You and admin install the sinker, give it the scope down bit of permissions, and tell it what KCP to reach out to and register itself. I to. don't know, and I'm a little concerned based on what the policy discussion is going to turn out. Is that would work for very low scale systems, and it wouldn't work for higher scale systems. The cube model does not work in a mixed trust context where like the cubelet registers itself and says I yeah. can be that like horrifically broken when you have different varying degrees of trust among nodes and I don't actually think that physical clusters are all going to be in the same trust domains like the fact that we've already discussed a reason to have a label high security means that the trust domain of that high security is dramatically different I do not believe that we will end up with a model where someone's allowed to register themselves as a high security zone Right. I think, uh, uh, to be clear, the OCM model is like, the OCM uh, spoke cluster registration model is two-phase, right? Something okay. says, I would like to join, and then a human on the other end in the hub cluster has to say, you're allowed. So right. I think that helps That helps with the problem but of, I'm registering as a high, a high security cluster. But this is super important is because the OCM model is only looking at like the first 500 or so, or 1,000 clusters from a single trust domain, which is a single infrastructure team. I actually do not think that is the predominant assumption that I would want to bake into where okay. we think a control plane could go because in a tenant system like that, individual tenants should be able to bring their own trust domains, which means there actually has to be an isolation between the act of registering and the act of accepting that varies by subset of the total control plane. Again, like this is hard to represent, but like Imagine instead of KCP API server here, you saw like a bunch of horizontal blocks with hard cut lines between them and then a bunch of sub box blocks within them. Then the mental model of like the sinker registering, well, which one does it register to? What permissions does it have? Becomes much more nuanced. I don't, again, like what I think we're kind of trying to say is we should set up for the prototype case and embed the break in the assumption that locks us into something that's just the ACM single trust model and calling that out, right? Like the OCM single trust model is not actually what we're going after. We're going after for a hard multi-tenant separation between allowing controllers to work across different security domains through a set of principled, exactly the pattern that OCM is using, right? Like the accept or the register accept paradigm will continue for all of this. It'll be there for controllers, mm -hmm. right? We probably will not allow a controller to just get root access to all the secrets of 7,000 logical clusters like that. That is a model in cube that's horrifically broken in the tenancy model. And so like those are things that are hard to build in from the outside. So we're taking a lesson from ACM address or OCM addresses the gaps in the registration in the node registration model. We want to adopt similar patterns, but then we have an additional constraint, which there isn't such a thing as a single point of ownership. So you can't register yourself without specifying the scope you are registering to. That said, it may actually turn out that, yeah, it looks exactly like the OCM registration flow because you're going to be registering into a logical cluster that is tied to your organizational construct where you do have access. And organizations bring and install sinkers on their own physical clusters, but there's no entity privileged to view all accounts or all workspaces, all logical clusters. Uh, without an explicit act, right? It would not be possible in the system like it is in Cube to get view all resources across all logical clusters. So that mechanism is TBD in the policy docs. And that's just why it's like, it, it's just calling out the assumption that we have to be a little careful about the assumptions, how they work. This diagram is fine, but then certain descriptions have to be nuanced. like. The yeah. speaker may have a set of credentials that allow it to register itself, and there might be an act process. Very likely there's an act process, but we don't yet understand the scope of how the um, how organizational policy will work across multiple sets of logical clusters, for instance, to say that enough. And that hopefully like that gets yeah. done soon. Not only not uh, not only registration has to have an act, but updating your labels has to have an act, right? Yeah. If I'm if I'm yeah. registered as low security and I want to become high security, something has to. And in principle, the original reason that the cubelet did it this way was just convenience because sure. the cubelet, the cubelet, the control plane is treated as a single security domain, which is why it's very hard to build tenancy into a single cube cluster today because 
the fundamental assumption is that it's a single security domain for the control plane. Therefore, from a mental model, the problem we're trying to solve is the exact opposite of that because we don't need something to solve the single security domain. We have that it's a single cluster. We absolutely need something to have the principled, something that we can actually pitch to a very wide ecosystem within Cube, which feels Cube like, but then offers the hard security boundaries between tenants, um, which today you can approximate by running lots of clusters, yeah, created control planes in different cloud accounts. That's a reasonable model that we would go here. And then the back plane for that itself is sharded. And the assumption being that, you know, AWS engineers have to go through a regulated process to access your EKS cluster. Similar patterns we would say want to be applied is um, if you want a controller to be able to, or if you want it as an admin to backdoor multiple instances, you actually have to go through what would be described as a, a service back plane policy that would be built into the constructs of how you run this as a service or as an operational team with a bunch of platforms to, it wouldn't be, you could just implicitly impersonate all users across all platforms, uh, unless your authorization system supported that, which we would again, probably counsel people not to do in this model. So, sorry, Jason, that's a bunch of problems that, I don't think it changes too much, but it changes the nuance of what, what permissions does the syncer have implicitly? I think we'd say, probably can register itself, probably cannot assign labels like the OCM model, unlike the kubelet based on these criteria. The, the syncer can register itself with uh, an API server, only one API server? I think it's very likely that however, and, and this will probably depend is like, there could be multiple different ways to do this, um, at least in my head right now. Everybody everywhere is going to be talking some variation of a cube API with an act cycle, uh, which is like, vol persistent volume claims are the same problem, right? Here's a claim, bind it. Here's a pod, bind it to a node. Here's a, um, here is a, and we don't have this necessarily in cube today, but like, here's a service. I want this service to be able to talk to this service. Cube doesn't actually model that. As a result, people go do network policy and come up with really complicated rules to work around the actual problem they're trying to solve, which is I want these services to be accessible to these groups. So the ACK model probably is going to come down to a sync somewhere a syncer is going to create a cube resource that the cluster, the logical cluster or cube API that it is registering to is orthogonal to the things that expose that location. So it is probably not going to be acceptable for it to create a location object in all logical clusters that would expose it, right? We want a layer of indirection there, but then the choice to expose that location is mediated through a different layer, which is probably, the, is probably some variation of a location controller or a policy, which says, like, I don't even know what resource the syncer should create, um, it may not be a location. It might actually be something like a, uh, a unit of compute with resources and all that. And that flows up through location and potentially another object that actually the scheduler looks at both, but then a syncer could write one and another thing could write another. That's like how the VM thing probably ends up being modeled is a controller can write both of those controller could write one of them. We just haven't gotten far enough down the use case. Um, and as you're doing this, we are concretely turning over places where we would want to decouple that model. Yeah, yeah. I still, I still think I would like to not. Uh, uh, I would like to scope this problem to clusters only, and because I think uh, we know more about how that world looks. And then, once that is successful, once that model is successful, see if we can turn it into a general anything scheduler rather than build a general anything scheduler. But, uh, so your your problem is absolutely get to the minimum viable thing. And then the stuff folks working on this in parallel will be giving the feedback around like, hey, as we're iterating, we might identify a reason to split this particular thing. Um, and it's very likely that, I mean, getting to the prototype, honestly, would probably be my statement of what we're trying to do with the design is show the the bones of a model that demonstrate the usability benefit we want, and then go back through in a second pass through that and transition from make whatever accommodations we would need for the larger scale system. So I, I think it's a totally reasonable approach to go down that path. We should just treat all of these boxes as like very small boxes. And then that well, we yeah, any, any box and any box and arrow diagram is not real life, right? A any of these are, are, uh, 
piled on top of hundreds of hand waves. So and, and that's why I'd want to see the data, the actual physical material bits of data flowing yeah. into an object, out of an object. That then sets us up to then say, oh, we actually need to hard separate the responsibility for setting this data because it violates a, it, it provides a trust inversion or something like that, right? Like it means it, it allows for confused deputy. It, it yeah. allows you to acquire capabilities, like as much as possible, like. I think we were trying, like the model I'm approaching this as is, can we actually build an accurate capabilities modeled system around this? Uh, Cube tried that, and there was a couple of places where we just punted on the confused deputy problem, which is acceptable in the Cube context and it, totally reasonable. I think we have to diff we are differentiating this from you could always go run a bunch of cubes if you want. We're trying to do something that lets you reason about the security of multiple cubes, which does not you have to have some principle at the base of it. So that's the only reason why. Yeah. Uh, the the sinker scoping question makes me want to skip ahead to, is, is, this, is this how we are envisioning sinker working? Where if you have two logical clusters, I made a mistake calling these A and B, but two logical clusters and two physical clusters, we end up running four copies of the sinker each. Yeah. I each. Think so. I, I do not want a one-to-one -one mapping between a sinker and a cluster because then that leads to the same problem. It, it doesn't offer enough of an advantage over the current models of propagating config to individual clusters, like an OCM model yeah. or GitOps style. Yeah. Like I ran an agent. We're trying to go after that next check, which is clusters today are dramatically underutilized in their ability to represent multiple dimensions of capability. So like I could create 15 different node types and offer those to different teams, um, it's super painful and you can't actually strongly tie resource consumption with resource permission, right? It's very, it's basically impossible in Kube today to restrict a team to uh, a specific set of available resources. Like say you have GPUs, there is no really effective way to quota how much GPU you can use um, in a permission sense you can use the quota system and you can use labels and all that. I think we're trying to get to the point of, can you, can someone model on a cluster what the chunks of, of capacity would be, which means more than one. And then they don't have to, they can absolutely do the one-to-one, -one, but then we don't bake in the assumption that it's one-to-one. -one, so then all clusters are treated as homogenous because there's, there's like 15 use cases I'm aware of where you have two things in the cluster and they sit uneasily together and you want to make an explicit choice to place them together. And there's actually like the beauty of this is like those two sinkers can all run on the same nodes if they wanted to. Um, and we want to think about the parameters for our uh, back pressure such that you could actually get a reasonable sharing of resources. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the main reason I wanted to confirm this was the model we were going for was for the sinkers permission scoping, right? That sinker AA watches logical cluster A and only has permissions to do stuff. Like, I don't know how exactly we'll model this to physical cluster A's RBAC, but sinker AA only has the narrowest set of permissions it needs to serve logical cluster A's request. So Yes. And, not, and not like I'm watching two logical clusters and making those manifest on this physical cluster. It seems too easy to confuse that to get it to do stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there is there is almost certainly, and this is called out in the, it's called out in one of the docs um, in some form, which would be um, there's an implicit assumption that there will exist a construct that makes the sinker A able to see all logically logical clusters that expose it as a location, which is something that like Cube doesn't really offer today and basic CRDs wouldn't offer because again, it's an out of cluster scope problem. What would be the, what would be the most concrete way to represent that? Um, don't know yet, but it, it would need to be fast, materializable, watchable, listable for Sinker to be a controller. And I, I think if we, we, we know that we have to tackle that problem, but it, it can be approximated today by brute force. And so it, it doesn't block the prototyping. At yeah. worst, if we found out that we couldn't make it work, that would be an argument to rethink how controller, like is the controller pattern actually useful in this context? I'm pretty sure we can make it that way. It's just, we don't, we're missing one or two constructs that would make it efficient. 
Yeah, I, uh, the argument against, it sounded like you were saying you still want syncers to be able to watch across multiple logical clusters. And I think that- yeah. the, the assumption is, is that a syncer will be able to say, I want to watch all of the logical clusters for the set of resources exposed by the location that I am um, granted. Yeah. There may be a couple different ways to model that, but implicitly that would be what allows a sinker to A, scale horizontally, B, it has it will have some internal structure, which is like, I've got to deal with things from multiple logical clusters anyway. And then um, it allows us to tackle head on a lot of the challenges that existing controllers don't have. Very few existing controllers watch everything. Like the garbage collector is the thing, and it's like a horrible hack of like, it, it's just disgusting and it works on, it barely works only because of the amount of engineering time spent in it. Mm -hmm. uh, most user experiences actually have the same problem as the garbage collector controller, which is they need to watch a lot of resources and show a reasonably consistent view of those. Um, there's probably an argument that we will have a construct, which is watch the set of things that that are relevant to me. And that's handled dynamically and given me, gives me a consistent list watch view. So if you're actually, let me update my, my diagram. Uh, it sounds like you're actually arguing we want something like this, where there's only one sinker, and it's watching. I'm going to undo all this later. But no, no, no. if there's two partitions on a physical cluster, there's two sinker instances. Those okay. control a unit of capacity. They're not watching logical cluster A and logical cluster B in the limit. They're watching logical clusters that have the location A. Uh, OK, so it's actually more like. You don't have location yeah. in those. So you should put location in there, which is yeah. there's, there's each of the physical clusters has two locations. There's a sinker tied to every location. Uh, and then there's a mapping between exposing a location into a logical cluster for the purpose of performing this action. OK, I think. Uh, I think I am coming around to this, and I think this actually solves a problem that I was talking about uh, earlier with some folks about confusing these sinkers into being able to do other things, right? So right. if, uh, that's not the one. Um, if it's watching resources in location A and location B, then it's not. you're not going to be able to trick it into giving some get, a user puts something in logical cluster B, but convinces the sinker that it came from logical cluster A and that it should be put into logical okay, cluster. So I'm, I'm going to make a recommendation. So let's call logical cluster one and two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> location alpha and location beta. Uh, one and two. Uh, alpha. Yeah. Okay. So sync, there is a sinker for location alpha on each cluster. And then the line is between sinker alpha and location alpha. There is the line between sinker beta is between location beta. And then the there is a, a list watch that the sinker can establish on the set of resources relevant to location alpha and location beta. And this is a thing that we need to think through. And it is not in any way like modeled yet, but it's that was actually my list on. Um, how to do uh, orchestrate logical clusters across n, n instances and be able to do consistent list watch across n instances and m logical clusters in the doc. So starting to sketch out what the solution space looks like so that Sinker Alpha says, hey, I just need somebody to tell me like all of the things that I should care about because if it has to watch everything, it has access to everything. And in Cube, originally, you know, we said, oh, pods can watch everything. Um, so they can see all secrets, which means that every like if you put a secret on the cluster, every every node had access to that secret. We added retroactively the node authorizer, um, and the node authorizer allows you to put a patch on the hole. But it was the hole was there. I think going in is what's the construct that we could use that allows any controller to solve this problem of instead of granting access blanket to everything in a scope 
the set of scopes are more concrete. So it's like almost the inversion of the namespace model, right? In cube, cluster is the hard boundary and namespace is a soft boundary. Um, but we have our back on namespaces that uh, controllers basically ignore most of the time. Flip that model around and imagine a system where the first level container, like a namespace, is the hard boundary. And then something in the background is synthesizing the cluster model. So that's like the, we're basically presenting something that'll work to compose clusters. Uh, and so then most people work inside that context, they get the benefit of namespaces. So we actually are adding something to the cube stack in a unique and novel way that gives you more power, which then on a single cluster would then allow you to come back in and retroactively build in hard tenancy to a single cluster. Because you could say, oh yeah, sure. Like there's the base API server that's part of a cluster that has no internal hard isolation. And then there's something that layers on top that provides that hard isolation. So you, you know, in theory, that KCP model then could conceivably allow any single cube cluster to acquire hard tenancy without having to change too much. I'm a little, I'm a little not sure about using non-hard tenancy components to make hard tenancy. It seems like it well, seems what, like which one are you saying is a non-hard tenancy component though? That the that the What's physical the clusters tenancy? the what physical clusters API server is not intended for hard multi-tenancy or, or hard tenancy boundaries, right? And so sure. but individual nodes aren't intended for hard tenancy boundaries either. And people emulate that with VMs yeah. to varying degrees of success. And, I mean honestly, like you know, the, the vulnerability rate of a container is you know probably twice or three X that of, of VMs, um, but both of those are very low. So what we're really trying to model is you should be able to create isolated clusters with isolated nodes for isolated workloads. But then in the same system without a physical change, you can compose that to share physical clusters for different workloads. And then you can share physical nodes. So effectively, we're trying to get at a system that allows us to model tenancy for all possible application types, top to bottom, which is a very ambitious goal. But it's basically the next problem when you look at like, what are people doing to compose applications today? They're building their own variations of these. And everybody's inventing their own tenancy and isolation concepts. And so, you know, looking for constructs that we could then plug in to other parts of the ecosystem, right? Like the cluster API nested, like you're just running a inefficient version of a logical cluster when you do cluster API nested, which is why it's interesting to say, how could we support cluster API nested by building in a harder tenancy layer? And again, like you're absolutely right, Jason, the mindset of you can't protect an individual cube API server, which is why we would want the tenancy model of the KCP layer or whatever, you know, KCP is the prototype, but you can have multiple chunks of those. The app model doesn't change. The operational model doesn't change. You just divide the your control plane in half and you say, split all these systems out. So you get the, you get a new primitive that you get to compose the own, the own way. Yeah, I guess, uh, we can definitely make hard harder tenancy boundaries up in KCP where we have logical clusters and and can separate them better. But if all it, all they're doing and we can make sure well users who really want to can specify this workload must only exist be the only thing to exist on whatever node it ends up on, right? It can say like I need node tenancy sole tenancy of that node, whatever node you assign me to. Uh, but in the middle of that something two two users will end up sharing the same physical cluster api server and only if <laughs> only if you expose that location to both of them though and i think that's the important thing is that the the middle thing that's in the location controller that doesn't really show up here is there's mm -hmm. another abstraction point between location and logical cluster but the sinker doesn't get to see that right that's the key that's the key unit of indirection which again we're, we're just solving the queue problem we're solving the general problem today of People have apps spread across different disparate physical security organizational domains. The way everything is built is you just run more of them. So mm -hmm. then the, the mental model here would be what's the minimum layer of abstraction we have to add to decouple location from centralization. So like the example I would probably say is location alpha is actually probably two constructs. There's a background construct, which is granting someone access to that location or a policy system that is saying oh yeah like um user this user can't get access to any of these physical you know uh 
any location that in any way doesn't meet the criteria of a high security isolation. And then the easiest one is you could always say, well, then there's just two locations in two different places that have the same name. Like you can physically shard your whole control plane. Like imagine you have a, a, a EU, like just for the sake of argument, um, you have an EU regulatory regime that requires you to have control planes physically separated in that geographic unit. The only thing you have to change is you just split the whole infrastructure down the middle and you can split your control plane in the middle, but the patterns don't change. Like an application targeted for high security still should be targeted for high security, targeted for the particular cloud provider, targeted for the particular um, organizational project. So the app didn't change, just the infrastructure changed. That's kind of the abstraction we're trying to get to. So, so a user who really cares about security would, would put themselves in a logical cluster separated from other logical clusters, put them, or, uh, request or get and get approved for a location for which they're the sole tenant, which maps to a physical cluster for which they're the sole tenant. And if they want to, they can also say this, this workload must run as the sole tenant on that node. Right. That we, we, that's like maximum security yeah, yeah, like mode. Node, cluster, well, infrastructure, node, sure. cluster, um, control plane. Right. Uh, the stack could be the same, you, but the difference being that you can actually define something that spans two of those, which you can't today, right? No cube right. app can span two physical locations or two physical clusters and thus deal with the implications of single cluster right. failure or, or API transition. So yeah, so that, that additional layer gives you something, but you could still reduce it to a single vertical stack. Um, but you know, with the appropriate certifications and controls, you can also share that control plane across physical sites because, I mean, technically, IAM infrastructures often run into this, right? Like organizations mm -hmm. run central LDAPs that offer impersonation functions. That means you can become anyone in that company if you're an administrator of that that IAM solution. Like LDAP, if you have right yeah. access to LDAP, you are root on everything in the infrastructure. Uh, we want to build in the constructs that allow someone by default to kind of mitigate that, for instance, by building in the constructs that would say, well, just because IAM says you have access to this doesn't actually mean that we've acted, for instance. Like being able to offer those controls will eventually show up as another property of infrastructure. And that gets back to the point about like the ACK operator as an example. The ACK operator may be the only thing that has access to orchestrate that account. You'd want to be able to run that with the appropriate best, best practices or constructs, but then offer an API where as long as you're really clear about who's allowed to call you, and then you're also clear about what you're doing on their behalf, um, you might have some confused deputy, but let's be honest, like if we didn't want confused deputy, we'd be running single core machines on physical infrastructure separated in a, a, a Faraday cage, and nobody does right. that because nobody needs that. Or I mean, do that. Yeah, there is, there is sort of the question of who the user is that wants that amount of tenancy, but still wants this amount of shared infrastructure right if, if you want the the highest possible wall you're going to just put it in your own physical infrastructure and not but, but but again a value here is that we're looking to standardize the kinds of constructs that people use to build infrastructure and applications so that in most cases yeah. everybody's reusing the same concepts and then somebody is allowed to dial at each of the levels. The dial you can't turn today is if you actually have multiple cloud infrastructures or multiple regions or multiple accounts. There actually is no way to do that without building your own. We're, ta we're trying to tackle at least the build your own dial um, and offer a primitive that's useful that inherits from primitives that people find useful in other spots. Like the, way, the same way Cube standardized deployment, can we standardize organizational tenancy policy and allow multiple systems to coexist, right? Like, can you combine an AWS tenancy model with for infrastructure with an on-premise tenancy model based on organizational control? Sure. Could you also integrate other approaches like um, when you need to have a multi-environment or multi-security domain policy? Can you tie that in the same way? Apps didn't have to change. The abstraction layer that sits in there lets you float across it. Ambitious, but dream big. Ambitious indeed. Uh, okay. Um, I will need to go through this and and inject the concept of location as an as a uh, proxy and intermediary between logical clusters and physical clusters. It, it would be good. I, I would go ahead and like just model the register accept 
here or model the register load set in a diagram that looks like this since i think we've all kind of acknowledged that there's you know the gap in the design of the cubelet is a mitigatable thing that there's plenty of evidence that we can use as an analogy here well and i like uh, i'd like to go into more and think more about the idea of registration so the, the current prototype, the registration protocol, is you create a new object of a cluster type and say, here's the kube config to talk to that. That's terrible. Uh, if the registration was just came up from the sinker, like to in order to register, a sinker shows up on the cluster and says, you can have this much of my resources. Uh, I have permission to do the stuff you like. You want to do in this cluster, I have the permissions to do that. And then, uh, Obviously, then something would have to like acknowledge that on the API server side and say like, yes, you are allowed. Thank you for registering. I will now use you as a, a pool of resources for. But it is now assigning that that capacity to some logical clusters is another question mark. Like now that now that a new physical location has showed up with some sinker that says I have 500 CPUs, use me. How do we reassign those CPUs and and uh, quota and, CPUs to logical? And the clusters? reality is is that ideally the best angle would be. Um, it should be possible to just start a new sinker with a set of credentials that allow you to acquire that permission when that's orchestrated by a system that's handing out those credentials because it is the infrastructure. So an example of that is um, you don't want to give something a cube config necessarily. You'd prefer that the sinker be able to acquire an identity that authorizes you to make us to set a certain set of things like that's kind of where the cube self-contained RBAC model works fine most people building layers on top of that are tying it into higher order systems but it's kind of a weak mapping but the problem that ultimately comes up is like if you're the ability to create an ec2 instance is the implicit ability to create something that can assume role depending on what you've set with the infrastructure there's a lot of infrastructure patterns that actually work best if the person who's orchestrating the instance is also orchestrating the tie because process security, like you're pointing out this before, like there's no perfect tenancy. The thing that runs the VMs is responsible for assigning identity to VMs. The things in the VMs that create containers is responsible for assigning identity. The things within the containers that connect to other systems are responsible for uh, you know, having their own layers of identity. So like an example would be a service that's exposed publicly that goes through a authenticating proxy is layering it up. You definitely want to have that chain of trust up and then you need to compose it with something. So like the example I'd probably use would be someone has a service which gives you physical clusters of some form in an account. The best outcome would be that's fully decoupled from the the create process such that someone can have that physical chain of trust up by saying, oh, I'm the one who owns the account. I also expose the API that I can test another system that says, is this person allowed to create con construct A? And the concept, you know, that's the capability system model of if I can create a cluster in there and give it the permissions that I have and I own the API, I can basically go all the way up the stack with a chain of trust. And if I'm consulting an identity system saying like, hey, I'm machine A, I just need a source of truth for the um, the modeling, like who's allowed to do what. But then you could basically say the sinker can come up and be like, yeah, yeah, I'm authorized to do this. I'm authorized to register myself. But we'll have a bunch of like lower level compositional things, which is someone just in the development environment. They just want to get their cube config. Mm -hmm. so think about cube config as the, uh, the cutting through the layers versus yeah. starting cube config and then trying to add the layers layers later later yeah 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 uh yeah i like that i will um i will look into acm's registry mo registration model and uh write more about that in this uh with the one minute remaining i am off the next two weeks after today so i will add this to the doc share this doc with folks uh tear it apart add to do add comments you can share with the doc mailing list uh, the group the KCP list. dev mailing list, yeah. Okay. And, and and you know, I'll make you an owner as well so you can share it with whoever else you want uh, while I'm gone. Yeah. Yeah. But I, just my other note is I have a couple, like I've been slowly iterating on a couple of these design points. I put them in the... Um, oh, right. We didn't even get to your topics. I mean... But it's fine. They're basically just, again, like uh, every discussion triggers new things. So I want to try to get a more concrete like you're doing as well on the policy side. 
but wow. it's kind of the active iteration through the design space. It, it's kind of like summarizing the what we're trying to do. Even this discussion, I think, is useful for saying like, what are some of the meta principles that we're still not calling out that would inform, yeah. you know, each of the layers. Um, okay, great. Uh, thank you for this very thorough conversation, <laughs> as always. Uh, and I will see you all in two weeks, and I'll share this doc immediately after this. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have thank fun. you. Enjoy.